Hello, my name is Amardeep Vidyarthi, and I'm your host for this inaugural episode of East FM's new Business Gurus feature. We're very excited to welcome our guests today and thank them for taking the time to join us. We hope that this session will set the tone for what we plan to develop into a regular event. We hope that through these sessions, our listeners will not only get insights into the current business environment, but will learn more about the lives, both personal and professional, of the business leaders invited to take part. The theme for today's session is COVID and beyond, and we will be exploring how this global pandemic has affected Kenya and what the future holds for us all in a post-COVID world. My first guest is Dr. Manu Chandaria, one of the best known Kenyan businessmen. He has been recognized for his economic and charitable contributions by both the UK and Kenyan governments and has been awarded no less than six honorary doctorates. He is founding chairman of the East African Business Council and of the Kenya Private Sector Alliance. He is a member of the Private Sector Advisory Council and is patron in Africa for the Global Peace Foundation. He also serves on numerous boards, committees, and councils, including his own charitable foundation, through which he pursues his passion for philanthropy. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Chandaria. Our next guest is founder, shareholder, and CEO of WPP Scan Group PLC a public company listed on the Nairobi Securities Exchange. He is a former chairman of the Advertising and Practitioners Association and was recognized by Forbes Africa as Advertising Leader of the Year 2012, by Forbes as Africa Advertising Leader of the Year in 2012. He has over 38 years working experience in advertising and communications and has worked with some of the biggest and best known global and local brands. Thank you for joining us. Our next guest is the immediate past chairman of the Kenya Association of Manufacturers and has recently been appointed to the board of Kenya Power and Lighting Company. He is the CEO of Scanam Interlabels, a leading self-adhesive labeling company that is part of the Norwegian headquartered Scanam Group and chairman of Chrome Partners Limited. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Sachin Gudka. I would like to really just kick things off now, if that's okay, and thank you, first of all, uh, for, the, for, for making the effort to speak to us and to our listeners. Um, gentlemen, COVID has hit the world hard at the beginning of this year, and governments the world over scrambled to deal with this unknown, and as it turns out, little understood threat. How well do you think we have handled the situation here in Kenya? And what, if anything, would you with hindsight have done differently? If I could put that question to Dr. Shandari. I think that we have handled it well, but you know, the question is uh, the effect of COVID on, uh, on people getting COVID, people dying because of COVID, people suffering because of COVID, but the effect is going to be on economy. And economy is, is slowing down, slowed quite a bit, and to kick start again is going to be very difficult. And in this whole item number, the people wanted to protect themselves and I think we've got almost 1.7 million people which have been laid off. And I think that the huge impact that we're gonna see that how the businesses, industries, and all other associations can help to build because it's not gonna be one man's job. It's everybody's going to chip in and make sure that we want to kick and get started because otherwise, I think the effect of long-term COVID is going to be extremely, extremely difficult. And what can we do as an individual? As an individual, we can do is to strive and find solutions because the amount of number of people that we've got unemployed today, and it's, it's, when you think about it, I'll come back when you ask me a second question, I'll come, what will be the effect of this? Thank you. But if I could put that question to you, please, Mr. Takara, how well do you think the government has handled the situation in Kenya with regards to COVID, and what would you have done differently? Uh, this, is a, this is a global uh, pandemic. So what's impacted us has impacted several other countries, or in fact, the world, right? I think we've done a, we've done a very good job. I think Kenya has managed it well. I think the government came into action pretty quickly. Uh, they put in the restrictions, et cetera. I think the inevitable uh, situation in terms of job losses, uh, you know, was 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 uh, was going to happen. Happened everywhere. 
I think I have a different perspective. Uh, and I think whilst I agree with uh, Manubai <clears throat> and that, you know, there'll be a long-term impact, et cetera. I, 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 I'm, I'm, slightly, I'm, I'm slightly optimistic actually, uh, because what I'm seeing um, is that a lot of people are seeing an opportunity in this, right? Um, opportunity in the sense that if you've been laid off, you're not gonna just sit at home and just cry about it, right? You're gonna get on and do something with your life. And what you may end up doing is a lot more productive, probably a lot more lucrative than what you were doing before in a steady job. Because what has happened, it has put us all on notice, right? That the world can turn topsy-turvy overnight and we need to be prepared. We're finding that, uh, and I, I'll give you an example. We are in the e-commerce space. We're doing a lot of uh, development for a lot of clients who had not been in the e-commerce space. So what we are finding is a lot of young Kenyans are enterprising enough to say, why don't I get into my own business? Why don't I start selling, you know, bogas or whatever online, et cetera, okay? And we have developed a particular platform uh, for SMEs called Gobi. And we've seen a lot of traction on this platform, which is a simple app. You take it, you can put your stuff online. And a lot of young Kenyans have done that. So I think what is happening is it's going to force people to look for opportunities which may end up positively uh, impacting you know what we think the covid world is going to be after uh, you know the, the what what is going to look like after covid so i'm kind of different perspective i've got i think there are the hygiene factors which we've done social distancing etc everyone's done that the government has started opening up the uh, the economy slowly and I think progressive countries uh, are going to do well. And if you look at China, China has already come out of it and got itself back on its feet. It's seen the opportunity. And I think most of the countries around the world who start doing that will start benefiting from it. But I think this was a lesson to be learned. And I think people have uh, looked at it. Uh, people have looked at it positively because you know sometimes change is inevitable. If you resist change, then, then you get washed away with it. But if you embrace it and say, okay, there's change, I know it's happening. What can I do to change the situation positively? I think there's a benefit for that. So good, Kurt. We've had two slightly opposing views from Dr. Chandari and Mr. Takrar. Uh, Dr. Chandari has spoken about the economic impact of COVID, 1.7 million people laid off, and how that will have a long-term negative impact on the economy. And Mr. Takrar takes a more positive viewpoint uh, looking at the positive changes he's seen and the fact that people who may have been laid off, for example, will be making changes in their life that will take them forward in perhaps a way unemployment, uh, sorry, employment would not have done. How do you feel about it? I think just to, just to get to the first question as well was, I agree with uh, Dr. Manu's assessment in the sense that uh, the Kenya, Kenyan government probably got the balance right between saving lives and livelihoods. Uh, there's no question that the economic impact has been massive. Uh, I believe we've, we've managed the health situation uh, fairly, fairly well. But economically, I, I think there's a case for both what uh, Dr. Manu said and also what uh, Bharatbhai said as well, which is... Uh, Yes, uh, adversity creates opportunities. However, the lead time for that can be quite long. Uh, and obviously a lot of things need to fall in place, including financing mechanisms, supply chains, uh, and so on, uh, for people to do something different and get their own brands created and recognized. I think in the short run, uh, Kenya does face a significant risk at the moment in terms of, uh, I would call suppressed demand. Uh, in order to stimulate that demand, a lot of things need to happen. I don't think we can expect really much help more from the government in terms of any fiscal stimulus and liquidity will continue to be stretched. So given that challenging environment and actually a lot of things were, were I would say the economy was not booming even before COVID. And in fact, it was going through a challenging phase anyway. 
And I think COVID's just sharpened a lot of focus, uh, brought a lot of focus and put the spotlight onto an already weak economy. So I think for us to get out of this, it, ne it will need a collective will and a huge effort to, to pull us out of this. Um, there's no question that formal employment numbers are down and the more uh, informal employment you have, uh, people, are, people are on the edge and that needs, uh, that needs rectifying. Thank you very much. Some interesting points raised. And perhaps I could, I could challenge you gentlemen a little bit. Um, how, how in your own businesses have you taken the challenge of adversity posed by COVID and address that. Mr. Takar, I know that, you know, within the advertising world, for example, um, many brands are scared to spend money on marketing and advertising at the moment. How do you, working in, in, in that world day to day, address that uh, and rejig your business to, to, fit, to fit the new reality? If I may, you know, what happens in our industry uh, is there was a knee-jerk reaction immediately after March. Uh, clients started cutting back, budgets were slashed, clients having conversations about reducing scope uh, because everyone's trying to manage their uh, bottom line, right? And I think also, you know, the worry was people won't have access to their product, won't have access to brands, etc. I think over a period of time, the realization soon sunk in that guys, this is going to be here for a while. This is not a short um, three, six month thing, right? COVID is going to be around with us for a while. And I think initially when WHO talked about it, people were a bit, okay, we'll find a vaccine soon. We'll find a vaccine soon and there'll be a problem solved, right? Um, but I think sooner or later people realize. So then the conversations changed. How can you agency help us um, launch this product virtually? Agency, how can you help us sell this product online? Agency, how can you help us create demand for this product, right? Because we got used to the idea that the weather is going to be wet outside, so we cannot keep on complaining. We have to go from A to B, and therefore let's figure out how we are going to not get wet and get to the other end. We may get a little wet, but we still need to figure out how we're going to get to the other end. And therefore it started becoming more positive conversations. So people who are more forward thinking in our industry, companies like us who had been embracing technology, e-commerce platforms, et cetera. We've got a financial platform that we do for banks. So it was, it was advantageous for us to take a high position. Again, being familiar with technology, how can you do virtual launches? Being familiar with technology as the one we are doing right now, you're doing this event virtually. You won't have yes. thought about doing uh, six months ago, right? It, I mean, none of us, were familiar with Zoom. We all knew Zoom existed, but now we know which buttons to press. And I think what's happened is remote working has made us connect with each other more efficiently. It's made us connect with each other more productively. And therefore what's happened is in my view, um, it's become a lot more cohesive. The world has become much smaller, right? Now we can work, whether I have somebody working for me who's sitting five miles away or 5,000 miles away, it makes no difference, right? Which means I can scale myself up to get the best talent from anywhere in the world and vice versa. I can sell some of my talent outside to my, 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 my global partners anywhere in the world, right? Like we did a campaign for WHO that ran across Africa. We did that in three days for WHO sitting here because we were working remotely. We mm. could, focus, could focus ourselves more. So again, I'm, I'm, I'm putting a very positive spin to all this uh, because I'm an optimist. And I believe that whilst we have economic indicators and we have uh, what Sachin has mentioned and one who has mentioned, right? I mean, these are realities, these are financial realities. And of course, there is going to be that downswing. We have to go through that. Um, but I think the answer that you are looking for me is how it's impacted my business and us. Indeed. And I and now probably out of that thing and in and, and, and my business, hopefully, you know, all going well, we will deliver back to the numbers that we had promised uh, to the shareholders at the beginning of the year, we will deliver. So we've kind of gone through that. I guess it may be different in our case. I know the banks and financial services are in a mess. Uh, the whole hospitality industry is in a mess. 
So I guess, I guess you know, there is some, 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 some challenges out there, but I guess it's about how you manage it. Thank you, sir. That's a very positive, uh, positive outlook, which is, uh, which is nice to hear. Uh, Dr. Chandaria, would you agree that you are seeing positive change being affected within business, both here in Kenya and also outside, because I know you run a, a uh, pan-African organization? Uh, I think that the businesses that we are in uh, probably are, are improving and probably started back. They might not be normal, but they are very much near normal. But it's not the truth with everything. Uh, let me give an example which might, which might just, you know, optimism of Bharat is very, very right. And, 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 and we should look towards the optimism. But the question is, very simple that you got 1.7 million people who are out of work. And approximately every person who is working has got four or five people at home to support. And when you talk about putting them together and multiply them, it's about 8 million people. Now, 8 million people who are not going to get cash in their pocket because the, the main driver does not receive a salary. And as such, he cannot take the cash. And as such, there is no food on the table. The question is that how are we going to work on this issue? Forget about that the Kenya has always had a problem of unemployment. There are already 3 million people who are not employed. But our system adjusted that. But now this short of 1.7 on top is creating a major, major problem. That doesn't mean that we have to feel that now, sorry, raise our hands up and say, oh, we can't do anything. Surely we can do something. But the question is that we must first realize that there is a major problem. And this problem has to, to, to find some solution. Now, the government uh, support on any COVID uh, you know, in, in requirements for, for supporting the families is going to be very little. A, a the fund, the government uh, income, minus the heavy expenditure that they have, and then whatever left is not enough to really look after this 1.7 million. So we have to find out ourselves what can be done. And all we could so look at that is, are we going to be in a position to support and find solutions? And that, to me, is like this, that how do we, can we borrow anymore? Kenya government cannot borrow anymore. They've overborrowed already. So it's not going to be possible. Maybe there are possibilities of World Bank and I may probably go ahead and give us some money. But again, the majority of money that comes in we will eaten up in, in, in the expenditures also. Now, the question is, how do we get out of all this? And that's the most important question that we should ask. This should be our preoccupation, not just once in a while. We should be thinking every day, every hour, and every minute. Hey, hey how are we going to get out of this? And if it becomes a preoccupation, we can start finding solutions. Solutions can only be found. Uh, and, and little smaller steps is not going to be any faster speed. Small steps, even if we can bring a quarter bread on the table of our, our people, it'll be a great possibility. So I think that it is now that we should not, we should not dampen that, how oh, my God, now what am I going to do? Yes. But understand the situation that it is not that easy and that simple that we can resolve it. But unless and until everybody puts up the as preoccupation, every industry, every business is just preoccupied with that, how are you going to get out of it? And I'm sure that then we'll find solutions because solutions are going to be there. It's not going to be something which is not there. But we will have to work ourselves to accept. But if we sit around and say, something that's going to be on our doorstep. No, it's not going to happen. And may I, ask, to... may I ask, Dr. Yeah. Chindaria, are there solutions or examples of solutions that you have seen that stand out to you where you think this is something we could do? 
uh, that you've seen yes. other people implement or that you've implemented yourself in your businesses? No, we, we, uh, right now in our businesses are, are not uh, implementing those, those solutions. But I think that we are trying to see that instead of us only manufacturing, are we creating a base for other people to participate in that? Now, until now, we manufacture a roofing. We'll sell to the wholesaler. But we want to see that down the line, that one piece of sheet will ultimately, somebody's going to put the nail on top of it. And we want to see that how it can expand it as much as possible. Now, is the sheets going to be there for a longer time? Maybe for a few months, yes, because everybody is mm -hmm. sitting at home. There is very little expenditure. People have got their money and they don't know what to do. That's the case today also. The yeah. people who are employed and they still receive the salaries, but their expenses are very low. Like my car. Let me take example of my cars. I have two cars over here. My petrol bill has gone to 25% for five months. So the question is that in everything that you have been doing, because the expenditure is gone down, the whatever the income that you've got is still available and there. So I think that if we, if we work it out, probably it's a possibility. I have no uh, single solution and say this can be done. It requires too many, many, many heads sitting together to find, hey, we want to lick this situation. We can do it. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Gutka, if I could put to you, uh, I know that in your previous role as uh, chairman of Kenya Association of Manufacturers, you interacted with many companies. Uh, and I think you will have seen some of these solutions firsthand being put, to, being put in place. Are there solutions that come to your mind that you've seen uh, businesses put into place? I would say, obviously, there's no silver bullet for all of this. Uh, obviously, everyone has to tailor solutions to their own specific circumstances and, uh, and deliver those, uh, those solutions rapidly and, and scale them out. Um, what we've seen, certainly, you know, because we're now at a situation where a lot of companies took a hit of close to a reduction in turnover of almost 70%, 70 to 80% um, in the months of April and May. And certainly, if nothing else, if there's nothing else, it does focus a lot of minds. Uh, the tourism, hospitality sector took uh, almost 100% uh, drop in revenues and the aviation sector. So different sectors are viewing this in different dimensions, but all with a view to creating what we call a sustainable cost base to ride out the drop in revenues, which may, which may even if they're not permanent, it may take us uh, um, possibly 18 to 24 months to even reach uh, 2019 turnover levels. And in that case, obviously, you do need to review every single cost item properly. Uh, as uh, Bharat Pai also says, the remote working part of it, what can people do remotely? Uh, is it making them more efficient? So I think it's about questioning every previously held assumption you had and really debating that with your teams and coming up with innovative solutions. People have also launched quite a lot of new products uh, now, which, uh, you know, which, and people are bringing them to, uh, to market faster. So the route to market has actually uh, shortened and, and improved and the speed to market has certainly improved. And I would say this has given people a lot of time to focus on the essentials, uh, look at their strengths, uh, drive innovation in their businesses and really come up. But the, the fundamental basis of all of this must have a sustainable cost base to remain liquid and relevant and, uh, and also possibly a uh, few companies have also considered acquiring other businesses in, in, the, in the sector as well. So we've seen that across the spectrum of businesses. In most sectors, we're seeing a rebound, uh, but uh, it, is, it is slow, to be honest. Um, so even the businesses that were down about 70% in, in April and May are probably down now maybe at least 30, 40%. It's better than what it used to be. However, 
um, in order to support that revenue base, you need a sustainable cost base. Great, thank you. So we see some themes starting to come through. The idea that um, out of adversity comes opportunity and companies must look to how to navigate these waters as best they can. Uh, technology, um, allowing companies to move forward, um, changing the way in which we work, launching of new products and so on and so forth. But as we talk about efficiency, often in Kenya, corporate efficiency boils down to reducing cost base, and that often boils down to cutting staff numbers because we are such a labor-intensive economy. What advice do you give to the common man who may have found himself or herself down at 30 or 50% of pay or on unpaid leave or even made redundant? Um, how, do you, how do you see that challenge being resolved. Um, if I could put that to Mr. Takra. Actually, it's a very good question. Um, funny enough, actually, I actually wrote this answer down a few minutes ago. Not that I was expecting this question. Let me tell you, you know, we do a lot of uh, consumer research all the time, right? Yes. So we have pretty good uh, insight into consumer behavior. Now, this is not only uh, in regards to Kenya. We've seen that in Nigeria. We've seen that in countries like Mozambique, uh, Tanzania, uh, and we call this the second hustle, okay? And I guarantee you that everybody that works for you, or at least 90% of the people that you're employed, had a second hustle, okay? This was their first job. They are either at a little shop that the wife was running, or there was some other business that the guy was doing on the side, okay? Uh, and and it's, it's fantastically amazing that there are so many enterprising people today because everybody wants to succeed. Everybody wants to give their family the best. Okay, you, you, I think the numbers of people that sit at home and cry is a lot less. You don't see so many beggars on the streets in Nairobi. The reason is that everybody has realized that you need to have a second hustle because there's no guarantee that your job will stay there with you throughout, okay? So the advantage we have in a situation like this is they're now focusing on their second hustle to make it the first hustle. And therefore, this is where the enterprising you know, behavior will come into play, right? Which is fantastic. Today, you see the amount of people selling goods on the streets of Nairobi everywhere. The amount of enterprising stuff people are doing, it's amazing, right? And I think this is, and this is an opportunity that they are taking out of a dire situation. And, and therefore, I think that that's, that was to my earlier point, the point I made earlier, right? That people are not gonna sit at home and wait for someone to put food on the table. They will find something to do and everyone has a second hustle. Thank you, sir. Dr. Chandaria, I know you do a lot of work, uh, philanthropic work with underprivileged people in Kenya. Do you see this coming through in the work that you're doing? Uh, let me first give you an example for which is uh, interesting. I, I read it only this morning. I'm a chancellor of USIU, United States International University. Yes. And this university is the, the first one which went online teaching. Now, when you talk about online teaching, obviously the subjects and the professor would remain. But there are so many things underneath will not be required. It, 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 that is to be understood. Now, when we decided that, how do we, how do we solve these issues? And so our board, we, look, I'm, I'm, I'm not a part of the board, but the board decided that, look, let's, let's put up a, a proposal that we will have, say, we will take off 25% cut in the salary. We'll take 10% contribution of pension for four months will suspend it. Uh, you know, like two or three or four items that they put it up and said, if we can continue with this, maybe we might be able to sustain it for the time being. Yes. Obviously, when, when I'm on the other side, the, the, the immediately the, the staff reacted and saying, they, no, nothing doing. How come? Why should you want to do that? We, we are profit-making institution, and why don't we just plow it back? Now, when the, when the finance department has 
worked out the system by which they can balance. And if balancing cannot work out at that particular time, it will be very difficult. So I'm just saying this one example that I saw it only this morning, there are three or four pages that I read. And I just was going to call the, the, the head of the council and ask him, I said, hey, have you thought about removing people, reducing people? Now, once you don't get anything discussed on the issues which are at least amicably understood, the other thing is that the harshest way is to reduce staff. And would that be right? So I think that, 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 that each one of us has to be, before we take a step, we've got to be very careful that are we taking the step which is not going to be hurting the whole organization. Now, when you talked about this uh, philanthropy, you know, philanthropy, it comes out of the businesses. And the businesses, if doing well, then the philanthropy will flourish. And the businesses do not come out well, then philanthropy does not. But at the same time, uh, there's a big issue about, let's example, we've got 100 students uh, every year for the last 40 years. We are, we are scholarships. Now, all the scholarship money has been already paid to the schools. Yes. Schools are not operating. Students are at home. They're not teaching neither online. And, uh, and, and when you go back, uh, uh, the, the expense is, expenditure is still on. There's no commitment within the organization that will reduce in such a way so that we can last, instead of these four months of COVID, we can then extend another two months out of that. It's not worked out. So uh, my personal feeling is that, that yes, we will have to put sacrifices. There is no way that we will have to, the life is going to be the same. The needs has to go down. There is no alternative to this. When, when, we can, when, when, I, when I sit in my home for last five months without going outside, I would have never thought in my lifetime that I can do it. Yes. But it's compulsion. It, it compels us to do it. And we are accommodating ourselves to that. And with that, my expenditure of everything that I, I'm, I'm using, except my people who are working for me, is almost reduced to almost some of them gone to 50% off, some has gone 30% off, because needs will become smaller. And we need to accept that we have to create that we cannot have the needs that we used to use and enjoy. It has to be reduced because otherwise we'll never be able to put it. Now, some of the people will be able to manage it, but I think what we are talking over here is not some people. We're talking about majority of the people. When, you, when we talk about 8.5 million people not getting cash at the end of the month, or every 15th day. What is going to happen to their, in their home? Just think about it. Yes. So I think that philanthropy at that particular time will play a role. We have played a role uh, for last four months. We've been providing rations, boxes to various people that we can think. But we have to find out, are we giving to everybody, anybody? Or are we going to the places where it is really needed? Yes. So I think that the that philanthropy will play a role, but at, at the end of the day, the philanthropy money comes from the businesses. If the businesses are not sound and not producing cash, then philanthropy will also get clubbed up. But philanthropically, mentally, not the not the money wise, is to support the community and find ways and means how we can support the community to make very sure that they get, go to the least amount of problems. That part of philanthropy, yes, every, every social worker that is uh, around in the, our country will have to go for it because there are answers which are not, which are not pound shilling and pence. Yes. There are answers which are of human nature and which we can really get something done about it. And I'm sure that the philanthropy will not stop. As I said, that they're not, not us, but many. Today we are supporting. But yes. where are we supporting? Kenya. Is that all? What about, what about outside Kenya? Outside Nairobi? <laughs> what about uh, 
So yes. I think that the, there has to be that the philanthropist will have to go up and say, what can we do? As you, I said, we cannot have a whole bread on the on the table. Can we provide a quarter bread? Yes. So that we do, our children do not go to sleep without food. You raise an interesting point, Dr. Chandaria, that I would like to put to the panel. Um, you know, we look we look to COVID as the biggest challenge that we're facing at the moment. And, and it's, it's hard sometimes to argue the opposite. But I would like to ask, given that so much of the impact of COVID is intensified or made worse by the underlying situation. Um, Mr. Gutka spoke earlier about the fact that the economy was not doing well beforehand. Is COVID really the biggest problem we have? If we were, for example, not a poor nation, would COVID be less of a problem? If we were not a corrupt nation, would COVID be less, less of a problem? Should we be more worried about the environment and changes to climate? Uh, we see flooding in parts of the country. We see uh, the rains failing, coming late, coming early. Are those bigger issues we should be focusing on? Um, perhaps, uh, Mr. Goodko, you could take that first. Thanks, Amar. Just uh, let, me, let me take two questions. The first one was your previous one, just to add my two cents to that. Um, I think a lot of companies uh, did, did the following. Number one, uh, they utilized their leave balances as much as they could for their employees. So employees were asked to utilize all their leave balances as the first step. The second step was maybe to work uh, a shorter number of hours if possible. Uh, the third one was what we call share the pain. Uh, because in order for the company to survive, there were sacrifices employees needed to make. And I think there was what we call a share the pain principle, whereby uh, companies took a, took a pay cut as there were substantial cuts to revenues and so on. Uh, and to ensure the financial viability of the businesses, uh, that was necessary as an immediate first step in terms of cash flow as well. So a lot of companies did do that. Um, and where it was, where company revenues were not impacted so much, there were no cuts uh, to, uh, to payroll and so on. So I think there was a mixture, depending on the circumstances, uh, I think people adopted uh, as, as, as best a pragmatic approach as, as they could to ensure the uh, financial viability of the businesses. Coming on to your second question is, uh, should we, be worrying about other things apart from COVID? Of course we should. Um, I think the climate change agenda and the whole area of sustainability is and continues to be a major one and one that major brands will continue to play their part because consumers are becoming uh, more and more conscious about, uh, about the impact of climate change and I think uh, you will see a lot of brand announcements from companies like Unilever, uh, uh, Procter & Gamble, and so on, working towards a proper sustainable agenda and to make sure that they, are, they, they have responsible actions in driving uh, the sustainable agenda going forward. So that's important. The second one is, is corruption a major issue? I think, to be honest, I mean, it is totally unconscionable, really, for people to have uh, taken advantage of the COVID crisis to make what we call super profits uh, or corrupt uh, or cut corrupt deals in this climate. And I think there should be a proper investigation of all those uh, all those people and companies involved. Uh, accountability should be brought forward and. Certainly, uh, I think the public would like to see convictions, uh, you know, uh, cases brought to court and convictions done. And at the same time, all the, law, all the assets recovered. So it's important that the corruption agenda be, be seen to be uh, fought, fought with teeth and with real action rather than just sporadic, uh, sporadic uh, uh, waving of the, uh, of, the, of the flag, so to speak. So to my, in my mind, uh, we can only really get this if we get 
uh, convictions and jail time for convicted offenders, as well as uh, derive uh, asset recovery in a very, very strong and aggressive manner. So I think that's that's my that's my viewpoint on on uh, climate change and, and corruption as well. But certainly, COVID has focused a lot of minds. Um, it's it's taught people to do things in a different way. Uh, I agree with Bharat Bhai on the on the digitalization part. There, there's enormous opportunities, and businesses will need to focus on digitalization. But at the same time, they cannot ignore the sustainability part of it as well as being good uh, corporate citizens uh, and good responsible citizens of Kenya. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Takrar, you've taken quite a positive view with regards to COVID and the impact of it on uh, the economy. What do you see as the biggest challenge facing us today? Again, I think I have a, uh, my perspective is slightly different. Um, I, I, I agree with everything that Manubhai and Sachin have said, but I think I mean, I'm looking at it a bit more philosophically. I think COVID is a, you know, a, a slap in the wrist or maybe a, a harder slap in the wrist from nature. Uh, you know, I think the world was misbehaving across. I mean, if you look at the Middle East, you know, Russia, Syria, Iran, you know, Korea, North Korea, America fighting, right? All that has stopped, kind of right? Because it has suddenly brought the entire humankind united against one threat, which we can't even see with our own eyes, okay? So I think this is a world resetting exercise, right? We can look at it in terms of what impact, you know, it has on, on, our, on our economy and, you know, all that's happened in corruption and procurement and all that in each country. But I think if you look at it, more broadly, you know, this is a resetting. It has reset your relationships at home. You're spending more time home. You're not going to Karaga joints now um, because this COVID thing is going to hit you there. Um, you're reevaluating your priorities in life. You're looking whether the job you had was good enough for you or not. You didn't want to quit the job because it was comforting, but now you've been pushed out. So you're going to rely on your second hustle and you may end up coming out better as a human being and a more entrepreneur and learn something new. We've all learned how to remote work. We've all learned that we all talk to our relatives more often on Zoom calls than we ever did before, right? We become a lot more closer. We make phone calls to our friends and relatives in other parts of the world. And today, the first thing when you send a message is, I hope you are well and keeping safe, right? We are suddenly concerned for each other. We, we never had that before, remember? So I think if you look at it broadly, I think this is nature's way of telling the world, guys, you're misbehaving. You're messing up the nature. You're messing up each other. You're messing up relationships. You're doing all these nasty stuff. You're fighting with each other. I think we just need to reset, rethink, pause for a minute, reevaluate. Look at the amount of people that have lost their lives, right? I think 800 or 1,000, 850,000, I think the last count I was looking at, 25 million people got infected, 800,000 have died or whatever. No, I think it's not, I'm not sure of the numbers, but I mean, they're quite large. Um, I think it was 121,000 in Brazil and 183,000 in the US. So a lot of people have lost lives. A lot of people we know who were fragile, health-wise, right, have died. So it's a wake-up call in my view. Uh, and I look at it like that. And I think, like I said earlier on, sometimes, you know, uh, change is to be embraced and not resisted. This is a major change that's happening across the board. The that's way life is going to be after post-COVID, we're not going to unlearn what we've learned now. Okay, we're not going, we will go back to the offices, but we may not go to the offices throughout. We may not need as much office space, which means we may not bring down so many trees, not have so many office buildings, etc. I don't know what the, you know, what the outcome eventually will be, but I'm pretty certain that the world is not going to go back to what it was. There is a new normal now, and we are all going to have to embrace a new normal, look at opportunities, be nice to each other, 
etc and and i think those days of all those people including countries governments were misbehaved i think will be shortly you know will be shortly lived i think great thank you sir uh dr chandaria your viewpoint with regards to uh what is the biggest challenge facing us in kenya at the moment is it covid or is it something else well i think covid has become one reason to start looking at so many other things yes uh if, if covid is not there uh we would just be sitting around doing nothing because the impact of covid is quite a bit and i call i call covid as an enabler it allows us now to start thinking and finding solutions it it is a possibility that because of the covid coming in it, what we can say is like this, in the many times i would say without shooting one bullet covid brought the whole world on its knees without shooting one bullet that was the fear factor that the whole world took it so badly and and, and said that look nothing doing and you know that means it's it's changed our ideas that attitudes towards so many things which we used to do and we just decided to accept it uh, i started writing to to the people when you talk about what changes we should be making i said that after the covid what we are going to see is that we're going to look of our, look at our mother nature our environment and our reducing our needs and keeping bringing people together for one common cause of becoming to find that we got an adversity on one side we have a problem on one side is to getting together and and try to find out how we can get out of it i think these four items are going to be running in everybody's mind uh, as as time goes on uh, maybe people might not look at the environment but to me environment is the major major factor and unless and until we try to reduce all this but the needs itself is going to reduce lot of pressure which are today on the minds of the people yes. because i have to run because i have to have two cars i have to run that i have to all that slowly slowly our needs are going to go down and it's better that it went down because to me there is no other alternative but to face it i don't think that we should we should sit down on a corner and say oh my god now covid we can't do very much let's make covid an enabler make it because of covid we can do so many other things that is a possibility so to me yes uh, yeah, the 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 mother nature and the environment is going to be a clear indication that we cannot just take it for granted it is not a possibility anymore so to me i think that it is it it has given lots of lessons and i think there are more and more people should be talking about the lessons that we are learning from covid because everybody knows what they are doing but i think there has to be some a mass discussion on issues like that today four of us are talking maybe tomorrow 50 people will be talking but there has to be some kind of a understanding how we are going to turn covid not as a threat but as an enabler thank you sir it uh, it brings to mind an interesting analogy where you know you look you look at the global impact or the global response to covid and there are those who say that the response has been such because for the very first time the rich and powerful countries of the west have been affected directly by something that normally was something that happens to other people um it raises an interesting question in my mind for us here in Kenya who enjoy a more privileged lifestyle where we often are able to find private solutions to public problems uh no electricity buy a generator um bad roads buy a 4x4 um bad security hire a private security company and we we often are able to live inside of this bubble i think covid has burst the global bubble and that is part of why we've had the the global reaction to this and i would ask you how do you think 
the Kenyan bubble has been affected? And how do you think those of us who are privileged to run businesses, to be in a position of relative wealth compared to the many millions who have nothing in our country, how do we now have to look at those people and how do we now have to support those people? Uh, Dr. Chandaria, perhaps you could take that. Yeah, I, I think that uh, it's a very relevant question that uh, are we going to change so that we can face COVID well? If we can't change ourselves, I don't we expect others to change. We should lead in a change. And number two, yes, we have to look after. There is no way being in a position, I'm an industrialist, I'm in a big business, I'm a big property holder, whatever I am, I've got a big farm, I have now a responsibility. Besides myself and my bank account, I have a responsibility that there is a, a huge amount of people who are around me. They don't come directly to me, but they're around me, which are now polluting the environment because of poverty, because of hunger. And that's where I think that all the big companies, better companies, must all start now working how they can support the people that they are. Suppose you have to go and tell them, I'm sorry, I'll have to cut 25% of my staff. But then after cutting the 25% of the staff uh, and reducing some kind of expenditure on the remaining staff, how can we just see that those 25% which are cut are not going hungry? And that is a start of feeling I am a Kenyan and I want to support a Kenyan. And this is most important, but many a times it will not come out unless it is discussed over and over again. Is it my responsibility? that I've reduced 50 people or 100 people, and those 100 homes are going to be, are not likely to get the jobs, are not likely to get, as what we said, start another business. It's not gonna happen all the time, overnight. They're going to, but come evening, you're hungry, and you can't go to bed with, with an hunger. And they come next day, and you're hungry. And that will not create nothing but this, discontent in the in the country and we just do not want to allow that to happen so i think it is responsibility of all people who can manage to go a little bit outside their own world of their own little businesses or bigger businesses or huge businesses and make sure how can they be a party to the pain that the kenyan uh, population will be going through if we become the party to the pain, we'll find the answer. But if we just want to sit around and say, oh, that's not my problem. Yes, it is your problem. And you've got to continue making sure that it is your problem and you, you make it happen. The, the minute you accept it's my responsibility, you'll go and do everything. But the minute you say, oh, I'm okay, then you'll just sit around and do nothing. And I think we do not want any more do-nothing people. We need a collective understanding that people who have something are prepared to participate and reduce that pain that is going to be so difficult otherwise because it itself destroying themselves ultimately. Thank you, sir. Mr. Takra, would you agree that COVID is going to force us to look outside of our our bubbles, if I may use that phrase. Yeah, I think I, I, I kind of alluded to that in the earlier answer, right? I think the world, you're not going to unlearn what you have learned during COVID. Yes. And I think what you've learned during COVID is efficiency. Uh, like Manubai mentioned, you don't need two cars. You don't need ABCD. You're not going to travel as much as you did before. So I think all this is going to benefit uh, some people. Obviously, the industries who are in that space will suffer. I think airlines are going to be the biggest. Uh, I think post-COVID, I think airlines are going to be the worst hit. So anyone had a stock in Boeing, you know, would be worried. Uh, because I think people have learned remote working and therefore there won't be that much need. People will travel. 
but I think it'll be more leisure travel rather than business travel. I'm yeah. pretty certain. I'll be surprised if everyone rushes back and travels as much as they did on business. So I think there's going to be the change. I think you won't require as much office space. So I think you've got all those, you know, kind of practical things that will happen. But I think more important, I still stick, stick to the earlier answer I'd given. I think people have realized there are opportunities, they have abilities which they did not say before. COVID has made open uh, those opportunities, given people mm -hmm. the difficulties that they're going through right now to overcome so that, you know, when we get out of this, we'll be better people. I think nature, as a result, will benefit. Less people traveling, less carbon, yes. less etc. I think as a result, that's what will happen. So I think, as I said earlier, it was a reset. And remember, COVID was not only in Kenya, it was across the world, it was a world thing. And, um, and I'm not sure we're gonna find, you know, the solutions that quickly in terms of the uh, vaccines. This is gonna take another six months, I think. Probably not six months, I think you're looking middle of next year. Uh, and then the post COVID world is gonna be a lot, lot, lot different than the pre COVID world. And I think people would have learned a lot from that you cannot be able to unlearn any of that. So I think it's going to be beneficial in the end. We've lost lives, people have lost lives, but I think this was a reset. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Mr. Gutka, any input from you on how you see society changing as a result of COVID for the better or for the worse? I think uh, my esteemed colleagues, uh, Manubai and uh, Bharatbhai have really covered it very well, very well. Don't really have anything add, more to add on, on that. I do believe uh, Bharat by saying that this is a reset, uh, reset time. And I think it has focused a lot of minds on what's important, what's not important, question a lot of previously held assumptions, questioned people's orthodoxies. Um, undoubtedly, I think people will look at this as an inflection point and see at least there will be some very long, uh, long lasting changes in behaviors which will come about and possibly some very necessary ones. Uh, it has been a painful period for those who have lost their loved ones. Um, a friend of mine lost his father to COVID on, uh, on Wednesday uh, in India and uh, unfortunately you know he's not able to go out and and uh, and uh, bury uh, his his own father. So a lot of people have gone through significant uh, family pain um, on this. However, uh, I agree. Let's let's use this as a, as a reset time and let's let's focus on what's really important and uh, and really start asking ourselves, how do we do things differently and how do we adapt to a, to a, to a new environment? Amar, I'll need to leave the call now. Uh, thanks so much for hosting and thanks Bharat Bhai, thanks Manu Bhai. Uh, we, we'll catch up later. Thank you. Thank you Sachin, very much appreciate you joining us on this call. Thank you. Um, gentlemen, I think that wraps up our hour. I don't know if uh, uh, Mr. Takrar, Dr. Chandari, if you had any questions for each other that you might like to put or any topics that were raised that you might like to address? Uh, no, I, I don't think that there is anything there to be addressed. I think it's a time to act. It's time to act and, and, and be a part of the solution. I, I think that it's not only a discussion that we must become. And, and anybody who comes in touch with us, they become a part of a solving the solution. So if they become a part of the, uh, of the, of the issue, then I'm sure that we can find solution. Uh, somebody else's problem, I, I'm sure that we can help, but we cannot really, if it's my problem, I know that I will put everything uh, that's necessary to make sure that that problem is over. So let's make a COVID a, as, a, as a being an enabler, but as a, our problem, not his problem, not government's problem, it's not my alone problem, it's our problem. And I think we can get out of it. Thank you very much, sir. Mr. Takrar, any final words from you? I think what we've learned is um, we took the world for granted, we took nature for granted, 
we took uh, everybody that worked for us and everybody we learned for granted. And I think what uh, COVID has taught us is, you know, we, we, we need to learn to live with each other uh, and, 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 uh, and live in harmony and, 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 and you know, not, not, take any, not take everything for granted because life is so fragile and the human race itself is so fragile. If you get something like a, like a virus, which we cannot see with our eyes, can actually wipe up wipe out uh, uh, the entire population. So I think it's been a learning. And, uh, you know, we take, we shouldn't take, the, we shouldn't take everything for granted. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Gentlemen, I'd like to thank you once again for taking part in our call today. Um, Banu, myself and the team will be in touch once we're ready to go to air with this and share it with you. We really appreciate you taking the time and uh, we look forward to further discussions um, and to seeing how East FM can work with you and with your organizations, not just on sol helping to solve the issues of COVID, uh, but anything else as well that we're able to collaborate on. Thank you. Thank you very much for asking us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, thank uh, you. May, may, may I just I must say thank you very much to East FM and thank you, Omar, for, for being with us there uh, and all the three participants that we are here. One is already gone, but two of us still are there. Uh, that we wish uh, that you will excite more people of what you are doing now. So that Thank you it can go to more people, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Jandaria. Thank you, Mr. Takrar. Thank you. Have a good day.